everyone. Give me a hands up if you believe that React is awesome. You heard about use memo, use effect maybe, yeah? A lot of hands, good, good. I picked up React a few months before hooks were introduced, and React has changed, right? And I feel like the same thing is happening now with React server components, where there's still a lot of questions. I remember reading this blog post by Wes Boss about the context API when hooks were first introduced. And yeah, it feels very similar right now, right? Like, a lot of question marks, how will we use React server components? The React documentation is now already um, recommending us to use Next.js and Remix and other full stack web frameworks to really take advantage of React as an architecture. So React is not only a library anymore, but also something that you have to implement. You need a compiler and a router and different pieces to work together for that. So very interesting to see how React is taking over more and more parts of our stack and embracing the server environment. Yesterday it was already said, right? Jeff Chef mentioned that I think um, there's no one-size-fits-all solution, and probably there will never be one. So if you're comfortable in your current stack, that's all good. But if you're excited about Remix, if you're excited about Next.js, if you're curious about React Server Components, I believe there's a really good time right now to go full stack. And my name is Andre. I'm a developer from Germany. I work here in Cupertino for LinkedIn. And I'm really excited, and I love building for the web. And I've never had a better experience building for the web than with Next.js and Remix. And using really taking advantage of the full stack of the web platform. So the type inference you get right like across the network boundaries, the co-location of client and server code. And it shifts with all these things that I don't want to mess with. I don't even know which compiler Next.js is using right now. Maybe you know. Um, it just works out of the box, right? And it's super fast. It's very convenient to use. Um, and we heard from Wes, right? The edge serverless. Oops, it's falling out. Long running servers, right? There's so many cool environments that we can take advantage of if we have access to a full stack web framework. So it's really exciting because we get all of this out of the box. So if you go back to work tomorrow and you want to explain that excitement to your boss, right, and you're like, we should try out Next.js for our next cool project or for our big migration, let's use Remix, right? And your boss is like, oh, why? And you're like, a type inference and a React server boundaries and suspense. You know, like, that might not be the right language to communicate to non-technical stakeholders, right? So maybe you have to put on your business hat and convert your excitement into something that your boss also understands. And that's usually a business case. Cool. So there's a lot of different angles you could take uh, to kind of convey a business case, right? You could certainly talk about developer experience and developer productivity, and you could make a case about these things. But I think it's way easier to talk about web performance, right? That's the motto of Reactathon this year. We have the web vitals. We know that they exist. Everybody knows about Lighthouse. It's easy to argue this way. There's also already analytics at place at your company, right? You're all measuring the speed index or largest contentful paint. So it's easier to run A-B tests this way. And most importantly, it's easier to translate web vitals into business metrics. There's so many cool studies already out there that kind of prove um, that if you improve web vitals, that it impacts revenue, drop-off rates, conversions, and whatnot. So it's easier to make a business case out of this. Cool. Obviously, a performance-based business case heavily depends, depends on your own org structure, your team capabilities, and your tech stack. Right? A business case is nothing I can just give you and you use. A business case is something you have to build at your own company. So everything we talk about here today is very theoretical. Um, all the images, by the way, are all generated by AI, so don't look too closely. Um, yeah, so this is all very theoretical, and it starts with you. So in your company, you invent the business case, and it slowly triples upwards, bubbles upwards, and you have to convince your team, your manager, and then maybe upper and upper leadership. At LinkedIn, we have a manager of a manager of a manager of a manager, right? And at some point, you need a final thumbs up. And for that, uh, you probably have to already provide an A-B test and show that really something impacted the revenue so that you get approval. At smaller companies, if you have a flatmate and you run a startup, it might be easier. Anyways, in each of these levels, you have to provide different arguments, right? You need different numbers, different proofs. Um, I hope this talk helps you to get initial buy-in. So if you're interested in going full stack, then maybe this talk, the arguments I'm giving you, helps you to convince your boss so you can take, take some time out of your day to invest in building an MVP using Next.js or Remix. Cool. So in this theoretical business case, what we will be comparing is a client-side only SPA, something like Create React App, um, something that runs on a CDN. We have heard a lot of these comparisons yesterday already. Um, so we own this. We are the front-end team, right? There's a back-end team. We are the front-end team. Um, 
We only run on the client right now on the browser runtime, and we make API requests to third-party servers, right? So maybe it's our own company, like it's, it's Carl, the, the Java guy. Um, it might be a different team. It might be 10 different teams. Um, but it's not us. We are the front-end team. We consume that kind of stuff. And our control zone right now is only the browser environment. So that also means we don't have direct control over the web performance because the web performance really depends on these APIs. If they don't implement pagination, then maybe our performance suffers, right? Cool. So that's why we want to migrate. That's the business case that we're trying to build. We want to have more control. And Next.js and Remix are good examples for that, but obviously you can also build your own framework um, or use any other SvelteKit. There are so many, right? Um, and what, what happens now is if you use one of these frameworks, we have access to the HTTP request for document and data requests, and we run on both the server and the client, and we own the full stack of the web platform. That sounds very PHP, but yeah, we, we own the web server again. So that's, that's what we gain, the web server and the tool of the web server, right? Cool, so I built a demo app for this. Um, just 80 movies in a grid, and I, I, yeah, I did this very much for Reactathon. It's a very conference-driven business case, um, and I ran a lot of lab tests, and we just heard already, right, lab, lab test is just a start. It's not really what performance is about, but it's a good start. And I did a lot of tests and even more tests on render.com and Vercel, serverless, edge, and long-running servers using Next.js and Remix and React server components. Yeah, and they performed very well compared to the client-side SPAs. And if you want to see the actual business case and the raw data, there's the QR code to, to that, and maybe you can convince your manager to get initial buy-in. But what I want to talk about right now, actually, is the seven ideas I used to iteratively improve the performance of my full-stack web app. So over time, I used more tools of the server and more tools of the server to make it more performant. So if you're already on Next.js or Remix, or you have already access to a server environment, maybe those tools help you as well. And if you want to migrate, maybe that's something you can add to your business case. What all of these seven steps have in common is that we take access and advantage of the server environment. Cool. We start with server-side rendering. We have heard all about that in React 18 streaming already yesterday. Um, but if we only server-side render without server-side data fetching, effectively what we do is server-side render our spinners. So it doesn't get us far. It's, it's not bad. You can see the performance is the same as the SPA for my lab tests. Um, but it really starts you know, like showing some advancements if we add and move our data fetching to the server as well. Cool. So what happens if we fetch our data fetching to the server is that we use our back end of our web platform as a proxy, right, as the back end for our front end. We still don't have access to the third party APIs. We don't query the database directly. There are still back end teams, but we as the front end team now have our own back end that is between us and the third party APIs. So we own now the control of the web performance because everything goes through our proxy. So we fetch the data on our back end and forward it to our client during server side rendering or during the data, like, subsequent data requests. And what happens if, if we do this is, first of all, we get rid of the spinners because we server-side render the content with all the data that is already there, and we forward it to the client. Um, but what we also do is avoid a lot of round trips. So if you have a client-side only SPA, you have to first download the HTML, then you have to download the JavaScript, most likely both from the CDN, and then you can start doing uh, data fetching, right, with Ray Query or something. So it's two round trips to the CDN and then an additional round trip uh, to get the data from the REST API server or whatnot. Um, and we have a, if you have a full stack web app, what we do is one round trip to the server where we start fetching the data. And once that is done, we download the document and we got all the data and the largest contentful pane can already start, right? We can start downloading the images and whatnot. So it's one versus three round trips for the largest contentful pane. Yes, we still have to fetch the data, but those are server-to-server -server requests, which are usually way faster, right? They might stay in the same data center. Um, yeah, just improve performance. For interactivity, we still need to download the JavaScript, but we're not blocked by that, and that is great. But what I'm most excited about is once we have access to the server environment and we do data fetching there, right, we can use it as a proxy and really own whatever we return and forward to the client. For instance, we can avoid overfetching by filtering out data. So this is like an example movie component to fetch like, to show like one of these movies on the page uh, for my demo app. But the third party API I used to fetch the movies returned a lot of fields I never used. Um, so I download them unnecessarily, right? Like it's just wasted kilobytes of data. So for 80 movies, that's like 12, uh, 15 kilobytes worth uh, three kilobytes, so we can save 12 kilobytes. Obviously it heavily depends on the data and the compression you use, right? Um, but just showcasing that if you avoid overfetching, you can really speed up performance by downloading less, uh, yeah, less data. 
you might say, no, well, I use GraphQL, and that already fixes it. And yes, GraphQL avoids overfetching, and GraphQL is great for orchestration and whatnot as well. But if you use GraphQL on the client, those libraries are kind of heavy. Um, so the first and then the second that you would need for Apollo, right? So like, you would kind of negate the, the, the advancements you have as avoidance of overfetching. So again, in, instead, I would say, move libraries to the server instead. Right? For all of your dependencies, if you build a business case, you can go through there and say, like, this is validation related, this is data fetching related, this is aggregation related, and maybe you can only run them on the initial payload, page load and you avoid including them in your client bundle. Right? And you can have only these tools if you have access to the server. GraphQL, for instance, just a proposal, I don't know if this actually works, but maybe move it to your Next.js, get server-side props, and use GraphQL as an orchestration layer only on the server, not on the client, right? and then you avoid downloading it. Cool. Similarly, you can move your own JavaScript to the server. This function filters out adult movies because I built a family-friendly demo. Um, you can move this filter function down to the client, right? Or you run it on the server. If you run it on the client, you overfetch data that you never display, and you have to download the filter function to, to execute. If you only run it on the server uh, during initial page load, like in your remix loaders, um, you avoid downloading that module altogether, right? So with smart tree shaking, it's not included in your client bundle anymore. So for all of your big modules, right, like if you move them to the server, you might be able to avoid more overfetching and ship less JavaScript. So for your business case, something you could think about. Cool. I'm getting repetitive, but stick with me. This is, uh, I'm trying to prove a point here. Um, we can move heavy computations to the server. Because usually your AWS server is way more powerful than your user's device, right? So it's speeded up stuff. Um, also, you avoid draining your user's batteries if you use a server uh, for heavy computations. But the reason I included this is because it always depends, right? Like, it depends on your use case. Sometimes it makes a lot of sense to do stuff on the client. Sometimes it makes a lot of sense to do stuff on the server. But the great thing about today's full stack web frameworks is that we have access to all the tools of the client and all the tools of the server. Nobody is taking the client away from you, right? It's just more tools that we can choose from to make the right trade-offs. That's why I'm so excited about Remix and why I'm so excited about Next.js. Cool. And really to drive this po uh, point home, um, caching, something you can only really do if you have access to a server environment. And if your APIs are slow and you're not the priority of the API endpoints because it's a third-party company and they have a lot of cons consumers and you're just one of them, um, then maybe with a full stack web framework, you can do the caching and own it, right, and really improve the performance for your application. Um, there's a lot of ways you can do caching with HTTP headers and memory on the server if you have a long-running server or you use a service like Redis. Um, and for my movie app, I actually had to do two requests to, to start downloading the images. So I had to download this movies config object and all the movies from the, data, uh, from the API. And then I was able to construct the image source. So it's this like base URL and some like config data that I needed for each image. So it's a request waterfall, which is fine because we have to download the movies anyway. Um, and usually this is also fine because we can make both requests in parallel, and then we await the data, and usually they arrive at the same time, or the movies config is faster because the movies are the uh, bigger payload anyways. But when it really gets annoying is if the movie's config, this like very static object that never changes, decides to take a little adventure on the internet and takes the scenic route, um, and now we are blocked by this like very static thing that we could potentially hard code in our app, right? So if you have a client-side SPA and you realize there's something that is never really changing, what are your options? You fetch it on every initial request, or you hard code it in your code, right? Like it's two bad options because you don't have all the uh, tools that you could um, possibly need for the job. So that's why it's so cool to have access to the server and the tools of the server, because in this case, you can use caching, right? Movies config is the same for all users. It never really changes, so we can easily add some caching headers there, cache it in a CDN, and avoid making the request altogether. And if you combine all these things together, right, uh, what, what do we do? Avoid overfetching, you need a server environment, server-side rendering, server-side data fetching, caching, um, move computations maybe there. Like, if you about all your features, think, where can I run this? Which is the smart, best tool to use for this, for this to um, job or for this feature, right? I'm pretty sure you can also improve the performance of your apps. Obviously, not one size fits all solution, but more tools are usually better. Um, and then if you tie this back to the already existing studies, and if you go to vpo.com, I'm very certain you will find some studies about your own industries. I'm pretty sure you will be able to build a solid business case. And yeah, remember, it all starts with you. 
because it bubbles upwards and once you're excited, you can excite your team and once your team is excited, maybe the manager gets excited and we slowly take it from there. And yeah, in the future, hopefully we all use React Server Components. Cool, thanks so much.